Hello friends of YouTube, welcome back to Mike Reads the World, where we spend more time reading and less time producing and editing videos. I probably shouldn't make that my slogan, especially if I'm going to be making more produced videos at some point, which is always in the works, but as it stands, that's how we are, even if it's not something to be proud of. But uh, we're reading today video number 60, country number 60, uh, Auto de Fe by Elias Canetti. Elias Canetti was born in Bulgaria, so that's why he is being counted for Bulgaria, but he actually lived a lot of his life in uh, Aust early life, writing life, in Austria, and wrote in German, and uh, he's more known, being a Nobel Prize winner, he's more known for his psychological work, Crowds and Power, and uh, some me memoirs that he wrote, but this is his only fictional work. And uh, Auto de Fe, the title, refers to, uh, it's Latin, and it refers to in the Spanish Inquisition uh, when they would burn a heretic at the stake after a trial. So, um, but it has nothing to do, the, the book is not about the Inquisition, or is it? What is it about? I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell you that in this video, because this is another book where I can say I didn't understand uh, eighty percent of it, or ninety percent of it, on a first read through. Uh, I think maybe I'll try. I'm gonna try in this video to get across what I understood and what I thought about. Um, I, I'm gonna read the back because it's at least an introduction, and then I don't have to trip over my own words trying to give you a summary of the basics. Auto de Fe, Elias Canetti's only work of fiction, is a staggering achievement that puts him square... Okay, blah, 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 right? It is the story of Peter Keen, or Kine, Keen, Peter Keen, a scholarly recluse who lives among and for his great library. The destruction of Keen through the instrument of the illiterate, brutish housekeeper he marries constitutes the plot of the book. The best writers of our time have been concerned with the horror of the modern world. One thinks of Kafka, to whom Canetti has often been compared. But Auto de Fe stands as a completely original, unforgettable treatment of the modern predicament. The Kafka comparison. I can see it. Uh, some of the works uh, that I read in Kafka's complete fiction were just as surreal. I could not follow them. The characters spent the whole book doing things that absolute, that made no sense to me. Um, <clears throat> or the whole story, whatever. Uh, but there are a few... The, the book starts out pretty understandable enough for like the first few chapters until it really starts to go off the rail. Uh, yeah, this, this librarian who I feel represents, I feel a big part of Peter Keen, what he represents in, in a lot of this book is very much like the same kind of thing as Ernesto Sabato's On Heroes and Tombs, where the author is just like following his obsessions into the depths and putting that in a book. An author that's suffering as they write. That's, uh, that's really wrestling with something and putting it onto a page. Uh, that's the kind of book to me that this is. It's a book about the, you know, the, Elias Canetti had no other way to express this obsession, and he was able to do it in one book. Ernesto, Ernesto Sabado took three over the course of 30 years, but I think it shows when authors write to, uh, to pursue or rid themselves an obsession, of an obsession. They're not necessarily prolific writers. Uh, they kind of write what they need to, and it's down, and then that's kind of, this was his one work of fiction, right? So, Elias Canetti, uh, obviously, uh, did not feel the need to go back to fiction after writing this, and it's quite a complete uh, work in the sense of uh, it's complete work. I don't know. It's not... It's very thorough in what it explores. Um, the, the intellect, how intellect tortures people, right? Uh, how uh, too much intellect can be a curse. Um, that is what Peter Keen kind of represents as the librarian. And, and I, think, I think this book 
uh, really causes a struggle for lovers of literature in general. And it might even have been meant to be that way, but it confronts you, you know, with the dark side of literature and books and getting lost in learning and uh, being as in the first, the first section calls it, a head without a world, uh, right? Just being up in your head and, and not connected. Um, so in this first section, Peter Keen meets, uh, well, he hires, I should say, a housekeeper. And uh, after eight years of this housekeeper serving with him, he notices her taking very good care of one of his books. And so he kind of, uh, in, in his mind, uh, um, converts her immediately into this ideal woman that he's been looking for, this company of a woman that he's, he's longed for. Suddenly this is all coming out. And so he marries her, like on the spot. He asks, asks her to marry him. And things take a very dark turn quickly. You know, it kind of seems like from his point of view, she's trying to drive him insane or trying to get at his will, she's convinced that he has a dark secret and she's trying to uncover. And things kind of start to unfold from here until we get to section two, which is the headless world, in which Peter Keen is expelled or chooses to leave. It's never really quite made clear uh, from his house and his library. And uh, and goes out into the world. He... he uh, meets what the book, I think, unsensitively calls a dwarf, you know, a little person. And um, the, and uh, this dwarf is named Fisherl, Fisherly, I'm not sure, uh, who ironically, before Bobby Fisher, dreams of being a chess champion named Fisher, who defeats Capablanca, which is like, wow, crazy. It's almost like he accidentally told the future. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so this dwarf dreams of being a chess champion. His wife is called the capitalist, and he's got this uh, very strange relationship with his wife. And you're thinking, like, maybe there's some symbolism going on here. But, I, like, I was never able to grasp it uh, after a first reading. And it's going to sound like, as I'm reading this, I am just totally confused about 80 to 90 percent of the scenes but I was still able to follow the gist of what was happening. It's indescribable. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm describing it, so it's not indescribable. But, like, <laughs> uh, it's hard to describe. This, this book was really, like, like unique in that sense that, uh, you know, very unique because you could get the sense of what was hap- I could get the sense of what was happening but without um, without actually understanding the details of the scenes that were taking place, because the characters uh, express themselves in such strange and uh, and uh, surreal and like um, uh, incoherent manners. The way I described this book to to my wife as I was reading it, I told her, "I this book is like reading." five about five schizophrenic people who are all experiencing different realities at the same time and maybe that's like supposed to be kind of you know well that's kind of what life is right now i don't i don't know but <laughs> that's uh that's the book doesn't have many characters which is what holds it together um so it's i i just said like what two books ago that book from uzbekistan um, the railway, I couldn't understand 80 to 90 percent of it because it had 160 characters. Well, this book has less than 10 important characters, and you always know who these characters are, and, and they're very strong, you know, you can really picture them and get a sense of what they're about. You know, they're, they're very vivid characters, but you can't follow what they're doing or their motives or it, it's they're all so mysterious uh at the same time and and so and the scenes are just told in in this like stream of consciousness modernist way that I can maybe compare a little bit to uh Berlin Alexanderplatz uh that's a really good comparison actually because Berlin Alexanderplatz um, I just like in this book felt very uncomfortable to read. Like I did not, 
I wouldn't say I enjoyed reading it, but was it impactful? Was it meaningful? Yes. And, uh, and I keep going back, and I think, uh, without spoiling the end of the book, um, the end of the book really brought home to me that this is a book about the, the suffering of the intellect, and the way that the intellect makes us suffer, uh, not only on an individual level, but in society, um, that's my, that's, that's my strongest connection and interpretation with it. And as a book, again, as a book lover, um, this is a story about a man who owns all the books you could ever want. A very learned man, Peter Keene, his housekeeper uh, turned wife, Therese, who is quite a study in herself. Um, and there is a strong wrestling with um, misogyny in this book, the hatred of women. Um, I have to point that out, but like, I'm not, I don't think, I don't think it's a misogynist book, but it certainly wrestles with this historical, like, uh, uh, vilified portrayal of women in myths, legends, stories, going back, you know, to the beginning of time. And it's like, lovers of literature, we can't deny it. Like, uh, you know, there's something, there's something in the history of literature and myth and religion, uh, just the history of the world, that this is something that we as people, all of us, men and women, are, we have to grapple with and we have to deal with and uh, try to figure out, right? So I don't have answers for that, but this book definitely takes that on um, and, uh, and acknowledges it. And being in the 1930s, it doesn't always do it in, uh, according to our modern sensibilities and in modern sensitives, what sense, uh, sensitive way, but I, that's kind of the point, I think. Um, so yeah, there's that. And, uh, and so, yeah, a lot of this book, I just keep coming back to Peter Keene as this character that, uh, that, uh, it, oh, the other thing I want to mention is this, yeah, when, when you really realize that the surreal, surrealism of the book hits, I don't know if I want to give away the exact moment. Okay, I do want to talk about it, so I'm just going to say, like, if your interest is peaked right now, uh, or at any point in the video, um, at this point I'm going to reveal a few more spoilers, and then maybe give one more warning before I'm going to, like, give the ultimate spoiler. Uh, when I'm really trying to figure out this book uh, <laughs> as best I can. I think you really have to reread it, though, to get everything out of it. Uh, as uh, our, um, got somebody who co comments on a lot of videos, I see George, you know, you'll, you said, uh, this, is a, this is a book that you have to read twice <laughs> or three times. It's the definition of a book that you have to reread. And uh, I would agree <laughs> um, to get the most out of it. That being said, I think there are still things you can get out of it on a first read. Uh, but the details, yeah, you're going to be fuzzy. And I'm not even sure on a reread that I would still be sure of what happened, the events happening. Again, I feel like this book is five schizophrenic people all um, communicating a different reality to each other. And it's just crazy. It's crazy. Uh, so anyway, the moment that the surrealism of the book really hits is when, <clears throat> after um, after Peter Keene meets the dwarf Fisherly, uh, they they go to a hotel room, and I got a I, I realized okay, Peter Keene's going around to all these like bookstores, and he's like collecting the books because he no longer has his library. But it wasn't clear to me how he was collecting these books. They talked about him holding a suitcase, right? So I'm like, is he just bringing all these books back to the hotel? And yeah, it seems like that's what, what's happening. And he brings on Fisherl the Dwarf as his assistant. And then there's a moment where it clearly states that he starts pulling books out of his head. And this is in the Headless World section. And then I'm like, oh, whoa. That's the moment I was like... Things are not what they seem here. And Fisher is kind of going along with it. I'm not sure if Fisherly is taking advantage of 
Peter King's craziness in the following chapters than to make money by uh, telling him all this stuff about this uh, this uh, this market or something. There's like a market he keeps bringing Peter Keen to that he calls the Teresanium, the Teresanium, like his housekeeper, Therese, his wife and housekeeper, Therese, um, <clears throat> the Teresanium. And so it's almost like he's feeding into this big fictitious world in, in Peter Keen's head to try to make money off him and then go to America. That's kind of what I gathered what for Shirley is trying to do. And his wife is the capitalist who is also, he's also apparently making money off her uh, being a prostitute. So, yeah, there's this this web. And then, um, so, yeah, that was the moment I realized this book was, like, way more surreal than I thought it was in that you got to reread this because, you know, the third-person narrator is omniscient it's not you know it's not a first person narration but the stream of consciousness way it's told is always from the uh, the subjective uh stream of consciousness of whichever character it's following so it will jump in the heads the head of i guess this is the that modernist style right it'll jump in the head of therese in a chapter um the wife and housekeeper it'll jump in the head of, of fisherly the dwarf It'll jump in the head of Peter Keen, but it's always an unreliable narrator because it's the stream of consciousness of whichever character it happens to be following in the particular chapter that you're in. The chapter titles are very interesting because the chapter titles are often major clues to what is happening in the chapter. And I didn't realize this until quite late in the book. Uh... The, the chapter title, it's one of those books, like the chapter titles sometimes say very specifically uh, what is happening, and uh, and then the rest, the, reading the whole chapter is just completely confusing. Um, unless you read the chapter, you, you pay attention to the chapter title. And the only other book that I've read that I can think that has done that is Gene Wolfe's uh, Book of the New Sun um, well, multiple books, depending how you think of it, but, uh, and that's a fantasy, you know, sci-fi, uh, s novel from the 80s, but, um, <clears throat> I'm sure there's other books like that, I just can't think of them, that's just the first one that comes to mind that does that with the chapter titles, using the chapter titles to reveal something, um, about what's going on in a confusing chapter. So, that, uh, now I'm just going to met uh do I really want to talk about the biggest spoiler of the book like how it ends uh you know I don't think I do I was going to but I don't think I want to do it um but I I I will say you know get out now if you don't want any spoiler whatsoever of how it ends I'm just going to say one thing so have fun go read it if you don't want the spoiler um <clears throat> the ending is a culmination of what I was saying about how the uh, the book to me is a story of like the intellect gone wrong, the dark ways of the intellect, the way that the intellect can turn on itself um, and not just on an individual level but looking back at all of human history. In the final part of the book, which is the world in the head, so you see what we did there? We went from a head without a world to the headless world to the world in the head. And the world in the head, we uh, we meet a psychiatrist uh, who is actually Peter's uh, brother, George Keene. And George Keene is, uh, he yeah, he's the head psychiatrist or psychologist of an asylum. And uh, he is... Um, kind of an antithesis uh, he's the brother of peter keen he uses his intellect in very different ways in a more social way you know purportedly to help people to help people um overcome their mental uh problems and and uh peter keen is more interested in like pure knowledge pure truth um but when they talk both of them kind of reveal themselves to be equally crazy in their own way, in my opinion. And um, 
and uh, their craziness kind of just just uh, pushes each other toward their own precipice. And uh, yeah, again, the book just ends with the culmination of kind of, in a way, it's kind of what I expected, how I expected the book to end. Um, not exactly, but like, it was pretty close to what I expected was going to happen. And there was a lot of foreshadowing, a lot of foreshadowing of it throughout the book. Um, I'll just say one word, because if you're still here, I warned you plenty of times without spoiler. Flames. It ends in flames. So, with that, uh, I have discussed, to the best of my ability, Auto de Fe, Elias Canetti, uh, a book to reread someday, certainly. I hope I do get around to it, because there's so many books I love and want to reread, and um, I, can't, I can't say I completely, like, fell in love with this one, but it was, again, a lot, a lot like Berlin Alexander Platz, where it was an uncomfortable but worthwhile read. I've never read anything like it. It uh, opened my eyes to what uh, different things that literature can do. But sincerely speaking, uh, up to this point, the stream of consciousness, frenzy, modernist, you know, frenetic uh, modernist style where like 80% of it is not understandable until you read it a second time or unless you like really, really think about it, uh, is not my favorite um, type of writing. Um, I prefer a little bit more kind of clear, uh, sort of fairy tale-like narration. Think The Magic Mountain or Tove Janssen. <clears throat> you know, just very, very clear narration um, that uh, tries to express ideas and descriptions as, as clearly and uh, sharply as as vividly as possible so that the reader like at least has the illusion of clarity uh so i guess that's just that's just where i'm at with reading but um i'm glad i'm glad that not all books are the same and i'm glad there are books like this and i'm it opened my eyes and opened my my you know uh viewpoints to what can be done with literature and i think it was an extraordinary critique of uh of literature, the human intellect. Um, there's definitely some sociological stuff about how people behave in masses in there. Um, touches of it that probably connects to his other work, Crowds in Power, and I'm very curious to read Crowds in Power. Um, so he, yeah, there you have it. I think this is the first video on YouTube that actually discusses this book uh, for more than a, a minute or two in, um, in English. So, there you go. Uh, book for Bulgaria, written in German, Nobel Prize winner, Elias Canetti, Auto de Fe. The next book uh, I'm going to be reading, or well, I already mentioned this one, but I'm still reading Four Reigns, and it might take me a little longer than I think. It is incredible. It was originally serialized, so I'm really taking my time with it. And the book itself, the events kind of take place over a long period of time. Uh, this is from Thailand, by the way, by Kukrit Pramaj. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that even remotely right. But it, it follows a, um, a, a girl's life, basically, through um, the living in, in the royal uh, setting, the royal palace setting of, of Thailand from the late 1800s through the 1940s. I'm about one-third of the way through it, but again, taking my time because it's a book where every chapter feels like a new episode, and I'm trying to read it in this sort of slow, serialized fashion, and uh, I thought I was going to get through it a bit quicker, so, you know, I went ahead and marked Thailand off on my map, and I also took videos of, like, Bulgaria, and you may have noticed in the last video uh, that I just zoomed in on Honduras and came out, so... Uh, what happened is I took videos of doing them all thinking, oh, I'll just keep them and then put them at the end of the videos, but it turns out, why am I even telling you guys this? See, this is the stuff I should edit out, but I won't. Um, I learned my lesson about uh, marking books off before I actually have done the video. That's the long story short, because <laughs> I accidentally deleted those uh, videos of me actually coloring them in. Anyway, <laughs> why? Why? All right, <clears throat> but I will probably be reading something else shorter before I finish 
Thailand for reading the world, and um, also probably a bonus episode or two because I got a book from the library that I want to read that isn't part of the Reading the World project strictly, but I want to talk about it. And then also an upcoming one year anniversary of my first video on this channel. I'm going to do a special episode for that. So thank you for tuning in to Mike Reads the World, and we will see you next time. Um, and I think I'll start doing a house plant of the week too, as you see on my house plants. That'll be fun. So have a good night or day wherever you are, and uh, thanks again for supporting the channel.